Well, good morning, about to be good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Before you go any further, can I um, ascertain from you how we propose the rest of the day should pan out? My, my kind of provisional view was that we'd have a lunch break at more or less the normal conventional time and then an afternoon break. Does that coincide with how you see it going? Precisely, sir, yes. Fine. All right. Thank you. I think it's uh, in which case may I call Mr. Alan Lusher? Yeah. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly, sincerely and truly declare, and affirm declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Lusher. My name is Sam Stevens, and as you know, I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Please could I ask you to state your full name? Alan Kenneth Lusher. Uh, thank you for giving evidence today, and thank you for the detailed witness statement which you've already provided. Um, I want to turn to that now, and I see you do have a bundle of documents in front of you. I do. Do you have your witness statement to hand? Yes. Um, for the purposes of the, uh, that's dated 10th of May, I should say, sorry, of this year. For the purpose of the record, uh, it's reference WITN 05830100. Could I ask you please to turn to page 49 of that statement? Yes, sir. Uh, you'll see it runs to 176 paragraphs. Yes. Uh, and at the bottom, do you see your signature? Yes. And could I ask you to confirm that the facts stated within that statement are true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, they are. Thank you. That stands as your uh, evidence to the inquiry. I'm going to ask you a few further questions. Uh, and I'm going to start with some background, uh, summarising your career at the post office before discussing some parts in more detail. Uh, it's fair to say, is it that the majority of your career at the post office was spent either in the audit team or as a contract advisor? Yes, that's right. And you joined the post office in 1982? Yes. And I think you initially started working in Crown Office branches? Yes, that's right. And then you, uh, you became an auditor at Postal Officer Grade, conducting audits of sub-post offices? That's right, yes. And then you worked in the audit team with promotions until around 2002, I believe? Just referring to my uh, statement there, it would be around 2002, yes. Well, should we, should we bring that up? If we uh, bring up your witness statement uh, at page two, paragraph five, please. Thank you. We, at, at the bottom, it's an incomplete list, but we have a list of roles which was, I think, generated from an HR system held, held by post office. Um, and we see you were audit team leader uh, East until 2002. And then below that, you moved into the security team as a security team manager. Yes, that's right. And my understanding is while you were in the security department in that role, uh, you were dealing with check fraud, predominantly. Uh, yeah, it was product fraud uh, was the, the overall remit of the team, and I specifically looked after check encashment fraud at that time. And that was uh, presumably customers of post office rather than SBMs and uh, sub-postmasters themselves? That's absolutely right, yes. Uh, if we can go over the page, please. <coughs> Um, Subparagraph so I, you uh, refer to a role between 2003 and 2005, RLM. Uh, later in your statement, I think you say that was a sales role. Is, is that correct? Yes, uh, that's, uh, that's broadly the role of the retail line manager. You preempted my question. Um, and then we have ma manpower planning. But at K, from October 2005, the C and SM16, 
Does that re stand for Contract and Services Manager? Yes, indeed. Really, the, the title um, Contract Advisor or Contract Manager can apply from that date onwards. I see. So right through until, uh, if we can go down just slightly, please. Right down until you, you finish at post office in August 2019, um, all of those effectively the role of uh, a contract advisor. With some differences. Um, from around 2010, um, the line P there, commercial contract advisor, I was doing a slightly different job, still within the contract role, but not looking after sub postmaster contracts directly. Uh, and thereafter, I was involved in looking after the contracts for the, uh, what we refer to as the multiple partners, partners such as Tesco's and One Stop and McCall's and so on, and those partners had uh, large numbers of post offices each, and so the, 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 uh, the means of, me of uh, managing the, the contracts was somewhat different. So it, with these larger firms from 2012 onwards, presumably you would have a, a contact at, say, um, co-op or who, whoever it yeah, is, yeah, yeah. you would deal with them, and then that person or someone within co-op would deal with the individuals at the... Per, at the in, in general, that would be the way that I went forward, yes. That document can come down, thank you. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on your period of dealing with postmasters uh, when you were a contract advisor um, and also when you were in audit. Before then, I want to look at some points on reliability. Um, and I perhaps said take that document down too soon, so if we could go back to it at uh, page 49, paragraph 175, please. Thank you. Uh, so, sorry, what, if we could start at one, 175. Thank you. So this is at the end of your statement. Uh, and you say, at the time of the introduction of the system and consistently throughout the time when groups of SBMs were questioning the robustness of the Horizon system, my colleagues and I in the contracts team were assured of its complete reliability. I was assured that the Horizon system was not capable of causing discrepancies. How often did you discuss the reliability of Horizon or its ability to cause discrepancies uh, whilst you were a auditor or contract advisor? Um, I, I think I'd be right in saying, sir, that um, as an auditor, the, the matter never arose. Um, and. and as a contract advisor, um, I believe the case of Rivenhall is, is mentioned in the documents, and I think that was the first case I came across when the uh, uh, integrity of the Horizon system was questioned. Um, we were, we being the, the team of contract advisors, were repeatedly advised by the by Post Office Limited that there was nothing uh, to be concerned about with the Horizon system, and the integrity was complete. When you say you were advised by Post Office Limited, who in particular uh, assured, gave you that assurance? Uh, well, the discussion came up in um, team meetings uh, on a fairly regular basis. From, uh, not exactly sure of the dates because they're so long ago, but from the, the first um, inklings of, of difficulties in, what, 2004, 2005, something like that, uh, right through till the end. That was a, a kind of a continuum. Things got, um, the pressure increased, as it were. Initially, there's not too much consideration given to it, but latterly, uh, the post office issued us with a statement to read out at um, application interviews, uh, which um, the legal team had prepared uh, to uh, assure people that the Horizon system was, was sound. Um, and so, you know, latterly, um, Given I, well, you asked me to speak up to 2012, didn't you? Um, well, no, if you get, do go on for latterly, please. Well, latterly, the um, concern obviously increased. You know, that's, a, that's an ordinary member of public watching the, the um, 
BBC documentary on the, on the case and so on, um, we became rather concerned and, and, and things changed in the team and the, the decision making roles uh, moved up the, um, the food chain as it were. Senior managers had to make decisions which had been previously made perhaps by contract advisors and so concern grew for myself when I had the opportunity to leave the employment of Post Office Limited, I therefore took it. I'm going to come back to that, that issue of matters moving up the seniority in a moment. Yeah, thank you. Um, when you say this, this message of assurance came in team meetings, where do you think the source of it was from? Um, was it more senior management or was it within your team? Senior management. That all the issues to do with Horizon, um, to the best of my knowledge, were dealt with by senior management. And again, are you able to identify anyone in particular who, was, who passed the message on to you that Horizon couldn't cause discrepancies? Well, my, my team leader um, in the final years was, was Keith Bridges. Before that, Lynn Norbury. Was that St Steve Bridges? Sorry. Keith. Keith, sorry. Keith Bridges, yeah. <laughs> so, think, do forgive me. Sorry. Um, and Lynn Norbury. Yeah. This belief that Horizon was not capable of causing discrepancies, how did it affect the way you approached sub postmasters who said they had a discrepancy that they couldn't explain? Um, well, initially, um, it made it very difficult to, to understand their point of view. We were given the assurances that the system could not cause errors, and uh, when a sub-postmaster came along and said the system caused errors, then obviously that's very difficult to balance up, isn't it? So it was difficult for us to hear and understand uh, the complaint of the sub-postmaster, but uh, any such complaint from, from my perspective would have been passed to the accounting people in Chesterfield who would be able to, um, to help out with the details of um, the horizon uh, implications. And you mentioned it earlier, and you say in your statement about SBMs complaining as to the reliability of the Horizon IT system. Yes. Did you ever have cause to doubt that Horizon was incapable of causing discrepancies? No, given the reassurances from the company uh, until much later, sort of 2015 onwards, um, then I thought the Horizon system, the integrity was complete. The inquiry has heard evidence um, that people within post office were aware of bugs, errors and defects within the Horizon IT system. For example, the inquiry has heard evidence of post office employees being aware of a bug called the calendar square bug in, in at least 2006 that caused regular discrepancies in branches for years. Do you think that contract advisors should have been made aware of such bugs, errors, and defects? I've never heard of that bug or defect before, and uh, yes, it would have been helpful to be aware of that, yeah. And why would it have been helpful? It would have been helpful because it would have cast doubt on the integrity of the Horizon system. Uh, in your statement, page 12, please, paragraph 41. I should say as background, you, you were asked as you say in your statement, you were given two Rule 9 requests, one of which uh, asked open questions with uh, very little, if any, documents, and the other, um, the other was more targeted, providing further documents. Paragraph 41, I believe, is a response to the first request. And you're asked about your recollection of uh, errors or issues within the Horizon system, and you refer to the uh, Rivenhall branch, which you've mentioned already just yes, yes. earlier. W what in particular stood out about this issue and the Rivenhall branch as to why you remembered it? The, uh, the sub-postmaster was Mr Ward, and I recall him being quite clear um, in interview um, in saying that the Horizon system or, or that there have been figures input into his account, uh, into the Horizon system, therefore, um, which were not of his doing. Well, let's bring up a document related to that, please. It, it's 
Paul 00117650. And if we could start at page two, please. You see that there, this is an email from you, Adam Lusher, at, at the signature at the bottom. Um, if we could just go back up onto page one, sorry, to get the time. Thank you. Uh, 15th of October, 2008, to Andrew Wynn. And then back to page two, please. You say that you attach notes of the interview to the email. We, we don't have copies of those notes, um, or the inquiry doesn't have copies of those notes. But you set out two uh, issues raised by Mr Ward, and the first is, as you say, a claim that on a, on a number of occasions figures have appeared in the checks line of his account, and he suspects these have been input to his account electronically without his knowledge or consent. Was that the first time someone had made an allegation like that to you, or had you heard something like that before? As far as I can recall, that was the very first occasion that I'd come across such a, such a, um, a statement. And in, uh, Mr Ward gave evidence in phase one of the inquiry, which looked at human impact, and so the evidence was going to how the uh, scandal affected him. Mm. Uh, and one of the points he raised is about these repeated discrepancies in the check line between mm. April 2006 and September 2008. And in his witness statement, he said that you told him that he was the only one experiencing uh, these issues in his interview. Uh, do you think that that's something you would have said, or do you recall saying that? Oh, I don't recall saying that in 2008, but um, given that it was the first occasion that I'd come across such a thing, it, it could have been the case, so I think it's rather unlikely, to be honest. Uh, could I also just say that um, I, you know, I read the statement that Mr Ward made and it's uh, very distressing, the, uh, the results of the, all this, um, um, the, the results on him personally. Uh, great sympathy towards Mr Ward. Uh, he suffered quite a lot. Can we just go to page one, please, now of this email? This is Mr. Wynne's response. Uh, to point one, he says, the only way post office can impact branch accounts remotely is via the transaction correction process. And that's something we'll come to cover briefly later on. Goes on to say, towards the end of that paragraph, Fujitsu have the ability to impact branch records via the message store but have extremely vigorous procedures in place to prevent adjustments being made without prior authorization within Pol and Fujitsu. Um, was that the first time you were aware of Fujitsu's ability to, um, to do as it says, to, to impact branch records via the message store? Yes, it would be the first time. And what did you make of that at the time? I'm pleased that you brought this um, uh, document forward because it essentially is um, me asking an expert on the Horizon system how to proceed with this unusual uh, allegation. And uh, you know, Andy Wynn, is the expert, has come back and said basically that there are extremely big rigorous procedures in place to, pre to prevent adjustments being made. And so my reaction to that was, well, there must have been some other cause because we've really ruled out the horizon system as being the, the problem here. Uh, of course, uh, Andy then goes on to say that if um, such a casual accusation could be extremely serious to the business, if there was in fact changes to the horizon system made without the consent of the sub-postmaster. What, if anything, did you do to investigate whether in this case there had been use of this remote access to affect Mr Ward's branch accounts? I don't believe I took any further action on this 
uh, accepting the fact that the, the changes couldn't have been made to the horizon system. Did you tell Mr Ward about Fujitsu's ability to insert data into the branch accounts without his, well, in, sorry, insert data into the branch accounts? I don't recall, but probably not. Why not? Um, because at, at that stage I would be content myself that the changes couldn't be made to the horizon system and therefore there must have been another uh, explanation for the discrepancies in the account. Well, what it says here is that changes could be made to the, to the system, there, but there were rigorous controls in place. Indeed. So for cases such as Mr Ward's and any cases going forward, did you consider it to be <coughs> important to ascertain whether those controls were being upheld um, when there were unexplained discrepancies? No, I assumed that they were being upheld. In terms of general knowledge of this ability for Fujitsu to uh, impact branch records, was this common knowledge amongst contract advisors? I don't know. Thank you. That document can come down. I'm going now to go to audit. And I want to start broadly by looking at the role of the auditor. Uh, is this a fair summary that an auditor's role was to check whether cash and stock holdings in a branch match the figures recorded on the latest account? Broadly, that is indeed exactly right. And leaving to one side the sources of information, did that role remain the same before and after the introduction of Horizon? Yes, it did. Was the role of an auditor to understand the reason for why a discrepancy arose? Mm, that's more difficult um, because there would be some investigation by the audit team to establish uh, uh, the reason for a discrepancy, a discussion with the sub-postmaster normally, um, which may result in the, the fact that you know, some local knowledge uh, the lottery scratch cards are kept in a different drawer or something like that which hadn't been disclosed to the audit, which would resolve the problem. Uh, you know, nine times out of ten would resolve the problem, but occasionally, of course, that would be left in the air. So there was some discussion with the audit team to understand the cause of an audit, but basically their role was to report on the facts. Um, going back quite a, lot, quite a way now to... Uh, when you started as a, an auditor, do you recall if there were any minimum qualifications or minimum experience required in order to be appointed as an auditor for post office? Um, a, d a degree of experience in, in sub-office contract. Um, in what, so, sorry, I missed that. Uh, sorry, a, a degree of experience perhaps with uh, working with sub-officers was desirable, but there were no formal requirements for qualifications. So working on the counter or as a manager in a sub-post office? That would certainly help, yes. Yeah. Do you recall what, if any, training you received? Uh, the training would have been working with other auditors. In your statement, you say in 1988 you were promoted and took the role of management accountant still within the uh, audit team. No. Um, so, sorry, was that...? No, a management accountant uh, role was separate to the audit team. I see, my apologies. Uh, so what was the management accountant's role? Um, the management accountant in the, uh, the area that was working at the time, I believe it was the um, Norwich head post office area, probably, or the Anglia district. It was the Anglia district. Uh, the role of the management accountant there was to do with uh, budgeting, monitoring budgets, producing performance statistics and communicating those things to the budget holders um, and probably not of interest to the inquiry. No. So, so it's then you go back to the audit team as a team leader? Yes. Uh, and, and again, was there any particular qualification or experience you needed to become a team leader? No, 
uh, there was no formal qualification <coughs> required. And I, I should just, um, I think it's clear, but be, put it as a team leader, you would supervise other auditors. Y yes. Very briefly, you, you've referred already to regions, um, and the inquiries heard evidence that in pre-99, uh, audit teams were organised regionally. And then in 1999, following a review, uh, the service was effectively brought under a national structure. Does that ring yeah, true to you? I don't recall the dates very well being so long ago, but uh, broadly that, that is what happened, yes. Can you recall whether that change from regional uh, processes to national process was um, in any way linked to the introduction of Horizon? I don't believe it was linked to Horizon. Was there, were there any changes to the audit process when you, from your region when your region moved into the national region? No, there were no fundamental changes to the audit, audit process, apart perhaps from um, the way the auditors were, were planned. The audits themselves were planned as greater reliance on risk management. And we, the inquiries heard evidence that the number of auditors reduced as well following mm -hmm. nationalisation. Is that, is that correct? That, that was a a steady reduction in the number of audits from the time I joined until the time I left the audit team, yes. And to what extent, if at all, do you think that affected uh, auditors' relationships with sub-postmasters? Um, well, the audits became less frequent um, at offices that were running without any difficulties and more frequent at offices that did have some degree of, or high degree of risk, should I say, rather than difficulty. Uh, the reporting line for auditors was moved into the security department. Do you recall that? Yes. And the security department was responsible for investigating allegations of criminal conduct within the network? Yes, I believe uh, Tony Marsh was in charge of the security department at the time. They were kind of separate wings of, uh, of operation that he managed. Uh, please could you explain the difference uh, in practice between the role of an auditor and the role of an investigator? Yes. Um, I think we've described the role of an auditor already in, in that uh, they produce the, the facts, the numbers, um, resulting probably in a discrepancy. Uh, the investigation team would be looking at the result of the audit um, and considering the possibility of a criminal investigation, um, usually either concerning theft or false accounting. So would it be fair to say that uh, um, how the system was designed at least, auditors were supposed to be doing a neutral fact-finding exercise, whereas investigators uh, would be evaluative and determining whether on the facts they believe there was criminal conduct. That's exactly right. Was there any difference in practice once auditors moved uh, under the purview of the security team? No. The inquiries heard evidence that investigators and auditors would uh, on occasion attend branches together at the same time. Yes. You, you do, you, so you do recall that? Yes. And why, why did that happen? The uh, investigation team uh, would ask for an audit to be completed at a particular branch because there were concerns at that branch there may be a shortage or something amiss. Do you see any problems with investigating investigators attending with auditors for what is an apparently neutral exercise in, a, in an audit? The investigators wouldn't have had a role to play in that uh, visit to the office until a discrepancy was discovered, disclosed rather than discovered. So. I mean, in those circumstances, would, would sub-postmasters be aware that the investigation team was there as well? Well, I can't recall any specific examples, I'm sorry. 
And on times when investigators weren't there, please could you just summarise when an auditor would engage the investigation department? Uh, yes. Uh, once a discrepancy had been confirmed in the accounts, uh, then the auditor uh, would, would normally contact the contract advisor first, uh, although uh, there would also be attempts to, to contact the investigation department, possibly. So there was three people involved there, or three parties involved, uh, uh, and, and if, the, you know, if the contract advisor had concerns that there may be criminal activity, then the investigation team would be alerted. Was that for any discrepancy or discrepancy no, no. of a certain level? The, <clears throat> generally, the uh, contract manager wouldn't be advised of discrepancies less than a thousand pounds or so, unless there was a, um, an admission of falsification of accounts or theft. Um, and uh, the investigation team, <coughs> their parameters changed over time um, uh, to the extent wherein Latterly, um, there, were, there were far fewer investigations and virtually no criminal prosecutions with an emphasis on the recovery of lost funds. Um, but um, if we go back to, I don't know, 2005, 2010, uh, then um, if there was a, any kind of admission or a larger loss um, with less likelihood of recovery, then the investigation team would be advised. Uh, on occasions, uh, they, would, they would visit the office there and then if they were able to, um, so that they were there while the auditors were still there, uh, which enabled them to you know, conduct investigations very effectively. You, you said then in your evidence that um, if there was a demission or if there was a larger loss um, where recovery may be more difficult, to par paraphrasing you there. Mm -hmm. Why would the difficulty of recovering the amount of money on the discrepancy uh, be relevant to whether or not uh, investigators should investigate whether there's been criminal conduct? Yes, that's a very good point that you raised there, and, and perhaps I was wrong in saying uh, that that would be, unless there was a very large sum of money involved, um, in, in which case an investigation would be worthwhile, even if there was no criminal, co criminal case to follow. Again, when you say I was wrong in saying, so you were wrong in saying that, is, did that actually reflect the thinking at the time, though, that, um, that uh, auditors would take into account the difficulty of recovery as to whether or not they would refer it on to the investigation team? Well, I believe I was probably wrong in saying that a few moments ago. Um, an auditor would be concerned if there was a large sum of money involved, you know, you know, ten, tens, hundreds of thousands of pounds perhaps, and may uh, at that stage communicate with the investigation department. And, well, earlier you referred to a thousand pounds, which is a number we see and will come to in respect of, mm -hmm. of suspensions. Do you know where the figure of a thousand pounds being picked for a, a sort of as a relevant figure for referral was? I don't really know where the, where that, whether that was empirically based or, or uh, just a convenient figure. Um, I don't know. But that was effectively what auditors work to, was it? Mm. Yeah. Very briefly on the conduct of audits, we don't need to turn it up. In paragraph 91 of your statement, you say that audits would generally be performed when the branch was closed. Um, I take from that that sometimes it, they will be performed when the branch was open. Yes. The, the, the normal thing was to try to arrive at the office before opening time and get access to the cash and stock so that an audit could at least be started before the public had access and, uh, to the post office and therefore service disruption was minimised. Um, the inquiries heard evidence from some postmasters that um, some auditors would carry out uh, audits while the shop was open. Yeah, yeah. 
um, which made them feel humiliated in public. Are you aware of any complaints at the time made by sub-postmasters as to audits being carried out in public while the shop was open? I can't remember any specific examples, but I can un could understand a sub-postmaster master feeling like that. So we've mentioned earlier, looking at audits again, that, that um, pre-Horizon, the audit would be done on a, a cash account that was done on a, a paper-based system. Yes. And at an audit, the auditor and the sub-postmaster could consult all the data upon which the paper-based cash account was based. Yes. And the sub-postmaster who put together the did the analysis and put together the cash account will be there to answer any questions about how that account was put together. Not necessarily, but normally that would be the case, yes. Yes, but it's, uh, let me put it another way. If the sub-postmaster was there, they will be able to answer questions on how the account was put together. Yes, that's right. Now, the introduction of Horizon, the cash account was generated automatically by the computer. <coughs> yes. What training did you receive in Horizon as an auditor? I honestly can't remember it so long ago. But it wouldn't have been very much um, training. Um, and uh, the auditor wouldn't have to uh, interact with the Horizon system very much at all during the process of an audit. Um, there was a starting figure which was important, which would be produced and presumably printed out on the last um, account, which would be the, the starting point for the audit. And so there, there wouldn't be very much interaction between the auditor and the Horizon system. So the, the process we, we referred to before, of when, when it was a paper-based system, you may ask quick questions of the sub-postmaster as to how the account was generated and, and questions here and there about that. The auditor couldn't do that with the <coughs> Horizon system, in that it couldn't, the auditor couldn't interrogate how the cash account was generated. Do you agree with that? Um, no, I, I don't think I can agree with that. The, um, the basis of the account was still available on the, on the Horizon system or by talking to the, the sub-postmaster. I mean, vouchers may still be on hand, um, which can be checked. Obviously, the cash and stock was still there. Um, uh, under a, a manual system before Horizon, then some of the vouchers would have been sent away and so couldn't, couldn't be checked. And similarly, under the Horizon system, the, the key difference, I guess, is that on the Horizon system, many of the transactions or increasing numbers of the transactions were dealt with entirely electronically. Um, well, let's put it another way. As, as an auditor, you, do you recall what reports you had access to, what, how, which Horizon could generate? Um, my time as a hands-on auditor was almost entirely pre-Horizon. Um, and so I was managing the, 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 uh, the audit team for much of the Horizon time, and so I didn't have that uh, level of expertise within the Horizon system itself. <laughs> I can't recall the reports that were called off. There was an office snapshot which was uh, crucial to the audit because that would uh, highlight and list the, um, the, the cash and stock on hand, enabling the audit to check the auditor to check uh, what was on hand against some figure from the account. Uh, the inquiry is very familiar with ARQ audit data, um, which is data held by Fujitsu, um, which shows activity on a, which was with the basis for prosecutions in many cases and shows activity used on the Horizon system. Um, as an auditor, you wouldn't have had access, or your team wouldn't have had access to ARQ data in the branch, would they? I as far as I can recall, I haven't heard of ARQ data before. If a, there was a discrepancy in, the, in a set of branch accounts that was caused by a bug error or defect in the Horizon IT system, do you accept that, as an auditor, 
you wouldn't be able to determine that the discrepancy was caused by a bug error or defect. Yes, that's true. This may not apply to you because of uh, you, your evidence that you weren't dealing hands-on with audits at the time, but I'll ask anyway in case you have knowledge of it. When Horizon was implemented, were you aware of a tool um, that would allow auditors to insert transactions into a set of branch accounts without the sub-postmaster's knowledge? Absolutely not. The, the auditors would not be able to amend the sub-postmaster's accounts. We, uh, if I say the words global user rights, does that mean anything to you? Global user rights, that would mean that uh, somebody could access the system with a presumably a password and have rights to every aspect of the system. Do you, do you recall auditors have, uh, sorry, I should, should rephrase that question. Um, do you recall um, in your time as an auditor having access to, when going into a branch, having global user rights access? No. Okay, I want to move on now to dealing with contracts and your time as a contract advisor. So this is 2005 onwards. Again, were there any minimum requirements in respect of the qualifications or experience required by someone before being appointed as a contract advisor? No, there were no specific uh, requirements of that nature. And did you receive any training upon being a contract, made a contract advisor? Now again, it would be working with uh, experienced contract advisors. There were train, there were, uh, or there was training um, during that time uh, for all contract advisors just to enhance skills. To what extent did you receive any training in human resources? I'm qualified as a Master of Business Administration for the Open University and had some experience of human resource management through that, but I can't recall anything specifically from the post office. Uh, did the post office provide any training on how to conduct disciplinary procedures? To, I should say, sorry, to contract advisors. Disciplinary procedures? Yes, so if someone was accused of misconduct, for example, a sub-postmaster is accused of um, theft or false accounting. Uh, I, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe disciplinary procedures refers to employment law. Uh, the sub-postmasters were, weren't employed by the post office. They were under contract for services. There's no issue between us there. I, I, I take that. It's just a, a question of whether or not as a contract advisor you received any training on how to handle um, a procedure where you were determining whether a sub-postmaster uh, was responsible for misconduct? Um, there was no initial training um, other than sitting with experienced contract advisors as far as I can recall. <coughs> but there was, uh, as I said before, there was training on an ongoing basis uh, I can recall uh, you know, a, a session of training where the contract advisors were all taken away for a few days to a you know, hotel somewhere and trained in the various aspects of interviewing, for example, and probably dealing with um, discrepancies and dealing with sub postmaster contracts in that way. When you're saying in interviewing in that context, is that interviewing for the purposes of determining whether a sub-postmaster was responsible of misconduct or for determining whether to appoint a sub-postmaster? The latter, uh, appointment. Was any training given in how to investigate whether or not a sub-postmaster was responsible for misconduct? Misconduct. Well, let me put it another way. Um, one of the roles of a contract advisor, which we'll come to, is deter to determine whether or not a um, 
a sub postmaster was in breach of contract. Would you accept that? Yes. Was there ever any training given to contract advisors on how to conduct an investigation into whether or not a sub postmaster was in breach of contract? I don't recall any specific training, no. Let's look at the contractual position for losses. Um, please, can we turn to your witness statement, page 19, paragraph 66. Thank you. Here, you open by saying you've been asked to confirm your understanding of the contractual position for losses. And you quote, um, the sub postmaster is responsible for all losses caused through his own carelessness, negligence, or error, and also for all losses caused by his assistance. Deficiencies due to such losses must be made good without delay. And the first part of that is to, well, it's taken from the sub postmaster's contract from in force from 1994. Indeed, and that, that statement is common to uh, a variety of contracts. There was a, a different type of contract, I think from 2011 onwards, called the Network Transformation Contract. Do you recall that? You'd be, yeah, the mains and um, local contracts. No, yeah. Precisely. And that, do you recall that that had a different um, position for dealing with losses for sub postmasters? No, I can't recall the difference. Um, can we please just turn in your statement? Sorry, forgive me, to uh, page. 32, paragraph 116. You are here, this is just for context, you're discussing the settle centrally function, which was brought in by the impact program and you're ref you refer to a document dated 14th November 2008. If we go over the page, please. You again talk about the Settle Centrally facility, but it's 119, you say at the time the contractual position in respect of losses was clear, and the SPM was responsible for all kinds of losses, whether caused by carelessness, negligence, or error, and losses of all kinds caused by assistance. That's not correct in 2008, is it? Um, that was my understanding when I put the uh, witness statement together. I stand to be corrected. Was that, well, actually, we'll, we'll come to that, that point now. Um, let's go back, please, to page 19, paragraph 66. Thank you. So it's, again, the, the clause is there in quotes. Could you explain what, you understood that clause to mean? Yes. Um, I see it as being fairly self-explanatory and that uh, the sub-postmaster was indeed responsible for losses as stated caused by carelessness, negligence or error and for all losses caused by the assistance, which of course means that there are, well, there could be losses uh, in the sub-office not caused by carelessness, negligence or error, uh, which would not be covered by this the statement. 
So if, it was if an, a loss was caused, well, let's start. Firstly, there has to be an actual loss. Yes. Secondly, if an assistant is responsible for that loss, the sub postmaster is liable for it. Yes. But if the loss is um, the sub postmaster's, it can, he, he or she is only responsible for it if it's caused by their own negligence, carelessness, or error. That's what it says, yes. So a loss caused by a computer error or a fictitious loss would not be the responsibility of the sub-postmaster. Logic demands that that's the case. The most common uh, cause of loss not caused by carelessness, negligence or error was, was a loss caused by a, a robbery or burglary, in which case the uh, security operations manual would be uh, the sort of the subsection of the contract which would come into play. Let's um, look at some of the policies that derive from this. And if we could turn up, please, poll 0008904. This is, as you see, the loss and gains policy within the Post Office Counters Limited Agency Network. At page two, thank you, we can see it's dated 20th of November 1998, so pre-horizon. Please can we turn to page four. This is the introduction, um, which says that it's a policy document that has been developed under the auspices of the Counters Risk Management Committee in order to provide clear and consistent guidelines about financial losses within the agency network. And if we could just go for a slightly further down, please. Thank you. At the start of the paragraph at the bottom, you see it says, the general principles addressed by this paper are of necessity mandatory upon regions. Do you recall being given this policy uh, and using it in the audit department? Yes. And so the aim of it was, as it says, to be a reference guide for post office employees on how to deal with losses or gains in accordance with the contracts between the sub postmaster and post office. The contract was very clear. I think the policy was, was more to do with um, the day-to-day -day deployment um, where there may be occasions to uh, deviate from the contract. Cases of hardship, for example. Well, we see in this, it's the third paragraph down on, on the, the page that's on the screen. From a purely contractual perspective, a sub-postmaster or other agent is responsible for all losses caused through his own negligence, carelessness, or error. Yes. It goes on to say the same with the assistant. So that, that's in accordance with the contract. Absolutely right, yeah. And this introductory section, is it fair to say that in an introduction to, to a policy document like this, you may read it once, but when you're going back to refer to it, you'll go to the more substantive chapters later on? may be the case. Uh, the, the paragraph you refer to does go on to say that this, this stance of the contractual position may be varied in appropriate circumstances. And yes, what, and as you say, it, it there talks about if there's financial hardship, etc. Mm -hmm. That's working to the benefit of the sub-postmaster if, if, when considering mitigation. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Can we turn to section three, please, at page 14? So this section deals with accounting losses, and it says the sub-postmaster is required to make good all losses however they occur. Sub-postmaster's contract section 12, paragraph 12. That's not what the contract says, is it? No. Do you know why this policy on the section for accounting losses contained this statement? 
I didn't put the policy together, but it does refer to the, the section of the, the relevant section of the contract which we've referred to. Uh, perhaps it's just an inaccurate shorthand to, to say make good all losses. Well, it's not shorthand, is it? It's materially different. Would it is materially different, yes. And would you accept that auditors who, or anyone using this document, would be misled if they read this um, paragraph? If they read the first part of the paragraph without the reference to the contract, and uh, without referring to the contract, they could be misled, yes. If we turn to page 33, please. So this is in an annex which deals with the detailed processes for cash, how to handle cash account discrepancies. And towards the, so if we could just go slightly further down, please. Thank you. It says, if the discrepancy is a shortage, the agent should be advised to make the amount good. If the shortage is the result of a known error, or if making the amount good immediately would inflict financial hardship, the agent may be allowed to hold the amount in the unclaimed payment section of the cash account for a period of up to eight weeks. C could you assist us? What, what does it mean when it's referring to a known error there? If the sub-postmaster um, <coughs> had recognised the fact that an error had been made and was awaiting uh, a, an error notice, in this case, a transaction correction, uh, to, to rectify that error, that would be a known error. So it was for the sub-postmaster to say, there's a known error here, um, and effectively persuade the post office that th this would be... Um, corrected in due course with, a, at that time, an error notice. Yes. That document can come down, thank you. Um, does this policy, or the point, the section three that we referred to, reflect the thinking of post office auditors and contract managers at the time, that if there was a loss, <laughs> the sub-postmaster had to make it good unless they could establish a known error? or unless there was financial hardship. <coughs> Leaving financial hardship to one side, if, if there was no financial hardship, was it on the postmaster to show that there was a known error? Yes. And are you aware as to why there was no ref a discussion in that policy of post office investigating the cause of the discrepancy itself? I'm sorry, I was, I was drawing breath to add, and didn't wish to cross your speech then, but um, uh, the um, unclaimed payments table could be used for known errors or, or disputes. Uh, so there would be a degree of softening around that. And, and subsequently, um, in the horizon days, um, then it would be like the settle centrally process mm. would, would be the same, you know, you can settle centrally only if there's a, a known error or if there's a, you enter the dispute resolution process. Well, that, sir, is probably a good time to pause and we'll come to the dispute resolution process after lunch. Thank you. I'll look forward to it. I was just unmuting myself. I agree, Mr. Stevens. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Two o'clock? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you.